Nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and America's gas industry. Developing new sources of gas energy and ways to use gas more efficiently for more than 160 million people across America. Hi, I'm George Page for Nature. The amazing adaptability of animals to their environment is a recurring theme in our series. Nature, given the time, has the capacity for tremendous changes. The ancestors of the elephant, for example, were trunkless, and the precursor of the horse, the dawn horse, was actually the size of a small dog. Birds, their ancestors were earthbound reptiles whose body scales modified and turned into feathers. The animals we see today are the result of an intricate process of geological and climatic change, of movements and migrations, and of competition and balance between species. But these changes are by no means limited to the animal kingdom. In the plant world, adaptations are a lot less obvious, more subtle, yet equally as fascinating. Most plants have developed defenses, chemical or physical, to ensure their survival. Yet with some plants, the evolutionary process has taken them a step further into a bizarre and even mysterious realm. Beautiful and very deadly. An exquisite creation compared to this crude effort of man. It's hard to believe that this was still in use until quite recently. An iron-toothed horror that smashed a man's leg bone to splinters and left him crippled for life. But how primitive when compared to this masterpiece of deception, hiding its sinister purpose behind a tender and innocent facade. In the 19th century, the discovery of plants that lured their victims, trapped them, killed them, and finally ate them, caught the public imagination. Explorers returned from steaming jungles with hair-raising tales of man-eating trees, of lurid sacrificial rites, good spine-chilling stuff for traveler's tales. And all of it was a ludicrous exaggeration. But an exaggeration based on fact. There are plants that eat flesh, although none has been found that can suck the brains from a human skull or crush and devour a maiden, as was once believed. Usually, plants are passive victims, victims of gargantuan vegetarian appetites. It is their lot in life to be harvested and consumed. The boundless productivity of plants depends upon leaves to trap the sun's rays and roots to absorb nutrients from the soil. But nutrients can be found elsewhere. 
wrapped up in convenient little packages called animals. Animals contain many of the things a plant needs, minerals and carbohydrates, plant food on legs. And it's the legs that are the problem. Animals are mobile and plants on the whole are not. How does a plant catch a moving target? The answer is deceptively simple. The familiar but amazing Venus flytrap. Found only on the eastern seaboard of the United States, it flourishes in ground too deficient in nutrients for proper growth. So it supplements this meager diet with the bodies of the victims it traps and squeezes to death. Each plant has about half a dozen leaves. Each leaf is a trap, which can be used several times. The two sides of the trap resemble two slices of juicy raw meat, irresistible to certain insects. Unaware of the danger, this fly is like a man walking in a minefield. The plant lures its prey by color, scent, and food. Glands around the lip of the leaf exude a sweet-tasting nectar, which in addition to the scent and color of the leaf, persuades an insect to try a taste of honey. The spikes on the edge of a leaf have a special function most useful when a trap is working at only half speed. This happens during cold weather or if the plant is in poor condition. Although a fly has quick reactions, it seldom escapes. The spikes act as prison bars long before the trap is completely closed. The way the trap closes and what makes it close seem more the product of fiendish invention than of nature. When a trap is set, the sides of a leaf are open in a V and face upwards. On the surface are six hairs, three on each side. These are triggers that spring the trap. It's almost impossible for an insect to walk across a leaf without touching one of them, but it's more complicated than that. The trap fails to close, although the fly must have touched a spike. And again, the same result. But there's nothing wrong with the plant. For a trap to close, either two separate trigger hairs must be moved or one trigger hair moved twice within the space of two and 20 seconds. This prevents the trap from being closed by accident, by a bit of dirt carried by the wind, for example. A needle bends the hair once, nothing happens. Twice, wham. The trap can grip very, very tightly, as you can see. Another fly touches one trigger hair and stops beside another. If it moves now, it will be caught. But how exactly does the trap operate so quickly and with such power? It seems to hinge along its center, but does it?
To answer these questions, we must look at the inner workings of the leaf, at the cells that make up its inner and outer surfaces, and at the trigger hairs themselves. We already know that the trigger hairs must be stimulated twice for the trap to close. The first time a hair is disturbed, an electrical message is stored in the tissues of the leaf. The trap will not shut until a hair is disturbed a second time. Another impulse spreads out through the leaf and reaches the outer surface cells which instantly grow in size by 25%. With the outer cells suddenly bigger than the inner cells, the side of the leaf is bent inward. The trap closed because both sides have grown together, but how does the trap open? Like the closing, it's a growth process. But this time, the inner cells increase in size, forcing the two halves of the leaf to flex apart. A trap can close and open several times in its life, and on each occasion, as the outer and then the inner surface cells expand in size, the whole leaf gets larger. A plant can quickly distinguish between what it can eat and what it can't. Unless it's digestible, it won't stay closed for long. A pebble is seized because the trigger mechanism has been correctly stimulated, but the plant's digestive juices will not respond to inanimate objects. And within several hours, the trap reopens. If fed a piece of meat, it may take a full week to reopen. Seen in time-lapse photography, the trap plates press tightly together. Digestive juices are secreted onto the meat and can be seen at the bottom of the leaf. The result is most dramatic. A good meal and there is a sudden and amazing burst of growth. It's this ability to digest flesh that enables the Venus flytrap to gain the precious nutrients on which all plants thrive. In the nutrient-poor environment where it lives, it needs to trap to survive. These death traps serve another purpose as well. They retain their ancestral function to trap sunlight for photosynthesis. But how did the ancestors of the Venus flytrap set out on the road to carnivory? How did these deadly and sophisticated mechanisms evolve from leaves that were passive? Most plants fall victim to animals, their leaves assaulted by browsers. But despite their placid appearance, plants are far from defenseless. To protect themselves from hordes of munching jaws, plants lace their leaves with toxins.
Some, like the sensitive mimosa, fold their leaves at the first hint of a bite. Others hide behind batteries of needle-sharp thorns or employ pugnacious ants as bodyguards. The Central American acacia does both. The ants live inside the thorns and feed upon nectar and protein provided by the plant. In return, with sharp jaws and a fearsome sting, they defend their acacia against all comers. A more subtle defense is a carpet of sticky hairs. Faced with this sort of welcome, a marauder might think twice before landing, for these plants mean business. Plants must protect their flowers and seeds well from hungry weevils and beetles. Even innocent passers-by are caught up in the act. Those too fragile to tear themselves free just struggle in vain. But among all defensive plants, the most deadly is Rorigula, a woody shrub found in South Africa. This plant is so smothered with victims and sticky glands that scientists long assumed it must be carnivorous. But Rorigula has no enzymes for digesting its victims, no means of absorbing their body fluids. The deadly gum is merely a defense to trap those that would eat the plant and it makes no distinction between friend and foe. The result would seem to be a great waste of life. Rorigula plays host to an army of assassin bugs. Their body surface and the architecture of their feet enables them to negotiate the glutinous leaves with complete safety. Their food comes to them. All they need to do is wait and watch. The plant does the rest. move cautiously. Only when the bee is too exhausted to struggle do they move in to probe and suck with their needle-like stylets. The bugs draw food and gain protection from the plant's extraordinary defenses. but they do have neighbors to contend with. And although the spiders feed upon the plentiful crop of insects caught for them by the plant's defensive glue,
The bugs are temptations. Not to be resisted. This plant has a veritable feast at its fingertips, but without enzymes to digest its victims, it's no more than a living flypaper. But there are plants that have made the next crucial step whose ancestors, like Rorigula, may have trapped insects for defense and killed them, but could not digest them. In time, these plants evolved digestive enzymes and refinements to attract victims. So were born the sundews, jewel-like and beautiful, but carnivorous and deadly. Sundews crop up all over the world in nutrient-poor environments like bogs, moors, even in semi-deserts. Although one fly may escape, sundews are among the most sophisticated of all death traps. Two ants find their way onto a long leaf sundew. Ant number one, attracted by the sundew's color and the scent of its sugar sweet droplets, is getting a hearty meal. Ant number two seems to be having second thoughts about eating. At any rate, it has the good fortune to escape. Although the first ant is still feeding, it's already in trouble. One antenna is stuck fast. Now the ant has discovered its danger and makes violent efforts to free itself. For its size, it's very powerful, but it's fighting against one of the strongest glues in nature, controlled by a plant that responds to every movement of its prey. Caught by the legs, the ant is being slowly enveloped. Its desperate struggles pull the droplets from the sundew's glands into a glutinous mass. twitches in its death throes, but already the sundew has released digestive juices. The plant has begun to absorb nourishment from its victim. To help with absorption, other tentacles curl inward to envelop the ant. In this long-leaf species of sundew, only the tentacles move. But here we see a round leaf sundew closing on a mosquito. 
In this case, the leaf itself curls round in its embrace of death. If an insect should escape, as this fly does, the leaf reopens. Like the Venus flytrap, the sundew wastes little time clutching an empty stomach. A mosquito is hatching on the surface of the water. Right underneath a cluster of sundew traps. The emergence of a mosquito from its pupil case is itself one of nature's marvels. When we watch it closely, stage by stage, it assumes a strange magic. The first action of the newly hatched mosquito is to leave the surface of the water. Quite naturally, it climbs up the nearest piece of vegetation, the sundew stalk. With its proboscis, it explores a glistening droplet, its first taste of nectar and its last. Now all the edible parts of the insect have been digested and the tentacles unfold as the sundew resets its trap. Only the husk remains and very soon this will dry up and shrivel. Back to the story of the second ant. It simply couldn't resist the lure of a sundew and from what we've already seen, its chances of survival are slim. But somehow, it wriggles free and bites the sundew. The victorious ant struggles off sticky-footed, perhaps wiser, and certainly very lucky. Compared to the slow-acting sundews, the Venus flytrap is far more effective. Because the two are closely related, it's believed that the Venus flytrap evolved from a sundew-like ancestor to cope with larger and more vigorous prey. Marshes and ponds are often acidic and low in oxygen, and plants find it difficult to absorb the nutrients they need. And for those living underwater, lack of light is an added problem. 
Nonetheless, competition is fierce as plans struggle to make the best of what's available. And what is available is animals. Ponds frequently teem with minute creatures, often with prodigious rates of reproduction. The egg-carrying female water flea is a good example. This abundant source of food is harvested by Aldrovanda, the waterwheel plant. An underwater relative of the Venus flytrap, it gets its name from the circular arrangement of miniature snap traps that cluster around its stem. Each trap, about a tenth of an inch long, is lined with about 40 internal trigger hairs. Sufficient, one would expect, to make it almost foolproof. But when it's well fed, the trapping mechanism is repressed. A trap snaps shut in about one fiftieth of a second, and it does this even against the resistance of the water. The force needed is not generated by cell growth, as it is in the Venus flytrap, but by the sudden release of a spring-like tension built up in the trap walls. Once securely inside, the victim is slowly crushed and digested. In its lifetime of a few weeks, each leaf can capture and digest a succession of prey. The waterwheel plant is widely distributed, from Japan and Australia to Africa and Southern Europe. Although its land-dwelling ancestors undoubtedly had roots, the water wheel, like many water plants, does without them entirely. How has such a specialized carnivore evolved? We can reconstruct its family tree right back to ordinary passive plants that drew their nutrients from the soil. These ancestors evolved sticky stems and leaves as a defense against herbivores. Later, faced with poor soil conditions, the added powers of digestion and absorption gave them a competitive edge. The evolution of these lightweight, sticky traps into the heavy artillery of the Venus flytrap allowed them to cope with bigger prey. Some carnivorous plants, however, have no obvious predecessors. Indeed, it's hard to imagine that this innocent-looking beauty belongs to a carnivore at all. And yet, the bladderwort shares both habitat and habit with Aldrovanda, the waterwheel plant. The stem of the plant extends beneath the surface where each branch carries a number of tiny bladders, each one a little death trap. The bladders tend to vary in size and shape from plant to plant, but they all have one feature in common, a small semicircular trap door operated by a cluster of tiny triggers set at the base of a funnel-shaped growth of guide hairs. The guide hairs funnel a potential victim toward the triggers which work the trapdoor. 
The position of these triggers can be seen if we watch the needle-shaped splinter of colored glass as it drifts upwards. Where the splinter is now is where the triggers will appear. Exactly how these triggers transmit an impulse to the hinge mechanism is still in doubt. But there is no doubt about what happens. When one of these centrally hinged triggers is touched, the trapdoor flies open inwards. Water is sucked inside, the prey is sucked in with it, and the door closes instantly. A trap operates in a thousandth of a second. Too fast to see, but not to hear. A mosquito larva has been caught. It won't all go in, but it shows very clearly the size and position of the highly flexible trapdoor. The guide hairs funnel it in, and that's it. Gradually, the rest of its body may be sucked inside. But if the larva proves to be too big, the bladder will probably die. Here, step by step, is the capture of a Daphnia. Less than a thousandth of a second. When a prey has been trapped, the trigger mechanism is reset almost at once because the water is pumped out immediately. The bladder's sides spring out as an animal gets caught. Water and prey have been sucked inside. This Daphnia is caught by only a single antenna. However hard it struggles, it will never get free. Sooner or later, some part of its body will touch the triggers again and it will go in. All along the margins of the swamp, thousands of traps are in action. Now even the last empty bladder on the branch is filled. Viewed from below, the bladder wart waves gently in the sunlight the only indication of the drama taking place beneath the placid surface. If a leaf can be fashioned by evolution into a chamber with a trapdoor and a trigger, perhaps one might expect to find other chambered structures in other plants also acting as animal traps. In the tropics, bromeliads would appear to be ideal candidates. The leaves arise as a rosette from a central stem. They trap water and all manner of decaying material. And although bromeliads are known to absorb nutrients from the fluid held between their leaves, it was thought that none actually killed and digested animals.
That is, until a recent discovery in the savannas of South America. This bromeliad has evolved all the trappings of a carnivore, an inviting but treacherous pool of liquid. Waxy leaves to clog an insect's feet and weaken its grip. and a means of drowning and digesting the foolhardy. It is, in effect, a simple form of pitfall trap, or pitcher. Pitchers have evolved quite independently at least four times. The Americas alone contain many species. They vary in deadliness, but all conform to the same vase-shaped design. In Australia, the exquisite thimble-sized cephalotus. And in the far eastern tropics, the jug-like Nepenthes, whose discovery gave rise to those terrifying but fanciful tales of plants that fed upon man. But the most remarkable of all these particular death traps is the Saracenia pitcher plant, native of the North American sphagnum bog. Saracenia derives its nourishment from prey caught in a cluster of horn-shaped leaves, pitfall traps. They have no moving parts and therefore seem all the more sinister. The entrance to the pitcher liberally sprinkled with alluring nectar, gives no indication of the danger lurking in the horn that lies beneath the surface of the sphagnum moss. It's a horn of death, and this is how it works. It's deceptively simple. An insect lands, starts to feed, and then falls in. A wetting agent helps to waterlog it. It drowns and sinks to the bottom, eventually to become food for the plant. Simple, yes, but why did it fall in? The pitcher leaf is patterned with guidelines whose colors attract insects. The surface is covered with downward curving hairs. These, like the guidelines, lead eventually to a rich area of nectar. This nectar field, increasing in density as it nears the well of the horn, lures an insect ever downwards, the hairs above making retreat almost impossible. Attracted by color and scent, another wasp alights on the collar of the pitcher plant. It begins to work its way in toward the nectar field. Its antennae, acting as scanners, constantly test the surface in advance, picking up scent molecules and leading the way to where the nectar is richest. Seemingly oblivious to danger, the insect moves slowly down the back of the leaf, pausing only to feed on the irresistible bait. But now, as the wasp comes into the central zone, its feet begin to slip on the downward-facing hair.
But in spite of this, the wasp continues to feed avidly as it slides slowly but surely to its doom. This nectar may contain traces of a narcotic, so by now it's possible that the insect is drunk and weakened. Although it can make full use of its wings, it fails to escape. But why does it keep slipping? The wasp evolves special feet for holding onto steep surfaces. There is a movable claw on either side of the tip and a central adhesion pad. When we take a close look at the surface of a pitcher leaf, magnified 1,000 times, it reveals curious spines on which an insect's foot can easily slip. And below the hairline in the nectar zone, the surface is downward lapped like roof shingles. Lubricated by nectar, this slope, as shiny and slippery as an ice rink, makes it all too easy to slither down into the death trap below. The dung fly is also attracted to this plant. A much lighter insect, we might expect it to have a better chance of keeping its footing. At the moment, all seems safe enough. But when a dung fly ventures out onto the vertical surface, it starts to slide as helplessly as the wasp. Its foot slips just as easily on the hard-ribbed, nectar-lubricated hairs. It topples backwards into the trap. Amazingly, in this watery graveyard among the husks of dead insects, we find living creatures, the larval stage of a mosquito called Wyomaya smithii. Far from competing with the pitcher for food, these and other aquatic larvae actually assist in the digestion of the pitcher's meal. Their jaws and enzymes help break down the victim's tissues, and their excrement is an easily absorbed fertilizer. For most insects, the pitcher plant is fatal, but for this little insect and others of its kind, the pitcher's horn of death has become a horn of life. The day comes when the pupil stage of Wyomaya smithii turns into an adult hatching out onto the surface of the very same fluid that proved fatal for so many other species. This little creature has no difficulty in keeping its footing on the wall of the pitcher plant. Off it goes, soon to return to lay its eggs. The insect shows no sign of being drugged. It even seems to feed on the nectar. No one has discovered how it avoids slipping on the surface which causes the downfall of so many other species.
Growing larvae swim around the feet of a dying wasp. One of nature's strangest stories. Saracenia is but one of several variations on the pitcher theme, and though similar in principle, each one has evolved its unique answer to the problems of devouring animals. But is it possible that all these complex and deadly structures with nectar fields, slippery slopes, and digestive juices arose from ancestors whose leaves were essentially simple and flat. The pitchers themselves are proof that it is, but how? Leaves, even ordinary leaves, are extremely varied in shape. Some, as they grow, pass through vase or pitcher-like stages, quite capable of holding water. Some codiums actually produce permanent pitchers on extended leaf ribs. These tiny structures have no known function. Others, like the teasel, form miniature lakes to prevent insects from climbing the stem. All these plants and many more have a toehold on the ladder to carnivory. All have the potential, given time and necessity, to become death traps. And now the strange story of the evolution of death traps reaches an even stranger ending. Or is it a beginning? The seed of a shepherd's purse has fallen, future generations dormant within. As if a prelude of perils to come, seeds immediately attract the attention of hungry creatures. The vast majority of all seeds that reach the ground are fated to be devoured by animals. But the shepherd's purse has evolved a mechanism to beat the odds. Its seeds attract soil creatures, but then they immobilize them with slime, kill and digest them. The delicate seedlings that emerge are fortified with a banquet of decaying worms and mites, their first battle over. Through the process of evolution, a tiny seed has become a carnivore. Perhaps the most bizarre of nature's death traps. Nature is made possible by public television stations, your gas company, and the gas industry, whose respect for nature and the environment is reflected in the underwriting of this series. America's gas industry provides 160 million people with natural gas energy all across the country.